greetings. So, today we will conclude unit 7 and this will be some sort of a bridge class, which will invoke everything that we have learnt about photoionization including the boundary conditions and then it will bridge this coursework with some literature, so that you can read original literature in photoionization research. Uh, we will uh, um, arrive at the Cooper's air formula for angular distribution of photoelectrons. I will not derive it in very great details, but I will certainly outline the essential points, which uh, lead us to what is famously known as the Cooper's air formula for photoelectron angular distributions. So, let us quickly recapitulate uh, the relations that we have with us. So, this is the expression for the photoionization rate for a photoionization process in which a photoelectron is ejected along the unit vector k f and the electromagnetic radiation is considered to be polarized along the direction epsilon. And then we have this e to the i k dot r term in the expression for the matrix element. And if you take an expansion of e to the i k dot r, then you have higher order terms in r over lambda. So, you can truncate this series for large wavelengths, right. So, for large wavelengths r over lambda will become a small quantity and higher powers of r over lambda can be ignored. And if you take the leading term, it is just e to the i k dot r equal to 1, which is known as the dipole approximation, in which case this matrix element of the gradient operator and this e to the i k dot r set equal to 1 gives you this relation in terms of the matrix element of the position operator. We discussed in the previous class, how to connect the position operator, the matrix element of the position operator with the matrix element of the momentum operator. Right? So, these are related to each other in a certain approximate way means depending on the potential being local and so on. So, these are some of the details that we discussed in the previous class. What you have in this rate expression is the modulus square. So, you get a cos square gamma term here and then the square of the modulus of the matrix element of the position operator. And together with this E square and this square of the matrix element of the position operator, you have got the matrix element of the dipole operator, which is why e to the i k dot r equal to 1 is referred to as the dipole approximation, because it is only when e to the i k dot r is set equal to 1, that you can develop the rest of the steps. So, this is the long wavelength approximation and it works reasonably well for 5 to 6 thousand electron volts above the ionization threshold broadly speaking there are exceptions. And then we also introduced the oscillator strength, we introduced the quantum mechanical oscillator strength for transitions from i to f. And then in the classical model of photoionization, we had the frequency distribution of the oscillator strength. right? So, there is a corresponding expression in quantum mechanics, which gives the oscillator strength per unit frequency. And that is a very similar expression compared to the classical expression, but it incorporates this quantum mechanical expression for the matrix element of the position operator as well in the length form. So, this oscillator strength, this is the quantum mechanical expression. So, this these two relations are combined and you get the quantum mechanical description of the oscillator strength, which is the oscillator strength per unit frequency. This is the frequency distribution of the oscillator strength and this is for a single transition, but then you need to sum over all the transitions. So, there is a summation over all possible discrete states, which you incorporate and you will find uh, an extensive discussion on this in Fano and Rao's book. So, this is the quantum mechanical description of the oscillator strength 
and it has been so defined such that you can carry out certain extrapolations of very important dynamical properties across the ionization threshold when you go from discrete to the continuum. And I will draw your attention to this figure from Fano and Cooper's review of review which appeared in reviews of modern physics and this is available also in Fano and Rao's book. And this is an oscillator strength distribution. So, you have got the discrete part on the left of this vertical line. So, this is the discrete part and on the right side is the continuum part and you have plotted in this the oscillator strength distribution which has been defined according to the prescription and there is a certain normalization procedure and I will not go into those details, but just draw your attention to this. What it allows you to do is to find that there is a continuity. You notice that if you extrapolate this curve, okay, you have a certain continuity which allows you to get properties to connect properties in the discrete part of the spectrum to properties in the continuum. And in particular, what are called as eigen amplitudes of the transition matrix elements, these are slowly varying functions of energy across the ionization threshold. So, the ionization threshold is over here, and over here, if you take a very small energy region delta E near the ionization threshold, in this region, the matrix element is almost independent of energy, it is hardly changing with respect to energy, and this allows you to study um, to, to connect properties of the discrete spectrum with properties in the continuum and there is a good bit of work which has been done by Seaton and Fano and this takes us to what is known as the quantum defect theory, which is applicable for many electron atoms. Here the, I have shown the spectrum for the hydrogen atom, which is a single electron atom, but then its utility and its power is most exploited for many electron systems for which you do not have exact solutions. And then you develop approximation methods and quantum defect method is one of the approximation methods, which uh, gives us a great uh, an excellent handle on this. What it also does is that it expresses energy not just as a function of n, which is the case for the hydrogen atom according to the which has got the SO4 symmetry, but other atoms will not have the SO4 symmetry when you have more than one electron. And then the 1 over n square formula has to be corrected by 1 minus 1 upon n minus mu whole square and mu depends on L. So, the energy depends both on n as well as L. So, mu is what is called as a quantum defect and all this goes into the formulation of the quantum defect theory developed by Seaton and Fano. And uh, as a matter of fact, there is there are huge number of references in atomic physics to Fano's work and the number of citations to Fano's work in fact, exceeds the number of citations to some very famous papers including by Niels Bohr, Schrodinger and so on. So, this is one of the classic works in quantum mechanics and atomic physics. Uh, which is of great importance. So, it is good to get introduced to that. So, our interest is in is in determining this matrix element, right. This is the matrix element for transition from an initial state to a final state. We are studying photoionization, but we are going to use techniques from quantum collision physics and we know that the solutions of quantum collision <coughs> physics and photoionization are connected to each other through time reversal symmetry, which we studied in the unit 6. So, we will use this relationship of getting the final state wave function according to the ingoing wave boundary conditions, right, which is what we studied in the previous unit. And the advantage of this is that we have seen that in the photoelectric effect, when you have the electron ejected, okay, that is the only direction with which with reference to which you can measure different angles, because that is the unique direction, right. There is no electron in the initial state in the photoionization process. The initial state consists of a photon and an atom. It is the final state which has got an ion and an electron, which is similar to the final state of electron ion scattering, right. 
So, in the initial state there is no electron direction to reference to, what you have is the photoelectron escape direction which is a unique channel and this is the direction with reference to which angles will be measured and the two processes are connected to each other through the time reversal symmetry as we have learned. So, we will use that in writing our expression for the total wave function C L, this is an expansion in terms of the angular functions and the radial functions, but then the expansion coefficient C L of these partial waves must be chosen according to the boundary conditions and the boundary condition of relevance over here is the n going wave boundary condition right. And what is that? C L must be given by e to the minus i delta L right, that is the boundary condition that we discussed in unit 6. So, C L is given by e to the minus i delta L, here by making use of the spherical harmonics addition theorem, you can expand this in terms of this m going from minus l to plus l and this is uh, this is uh, this was done in unit 6. So, uh, this is what will lead us to the Cooper's air formula okay, this expression using the in going wave boundary condition. So, let us have a look at this. So, here you find that the 2 l plus 1 and this 2 l plus 1 cancel each other. I have used the spherical harmonic addition theorem to expand the p l cos theta. Okay. So, the 2 l plus 1 in the numerator and the denominator cancel each other and you can write this wave function, the total wave function according to the ingoing wave boundary condition in terms of this radial function which is this which includes the scattering phase shift. Okay. This is written as r radial function r of r, then there is the spherical harmonic y l m of r which is coming from here and then everything else which includes this i to the l and e to the minus i delta l the phase shift okay, this factor 4 pi and the spherical harmonic corresponding to the direction of the photoelectron escape direction which is the unique direction right. That goes into an angular factor which is written compactly as a l m okay, because it will depend on l and the dependence includes the dependence of the phase shift delta on L right. It will also parametrically depend on the energy because the phase shift depends on energy. So, this is what you want to determine this is the matrix element and you want to determine the matrix element of the position operator. So, we take the r dot E x, E x is the direction of polarization and this angle is cosine gamma. So, this is the gamma which is the angle between the polarization direction which is along E x and the photoelectron escape direction. So, this is like measuring a polar angle not with respect to the z axis over here, but with respect to the direction of polarization right. So, theta this is an uppercase theta as opposed to this theta. So, there are two theta angles this theta ang angle is the polar angle with respect to the z axis as we typically use in spherical polar coordinate system. This is a different theta which is like the uppercase theta and this is the polar angle measured with respect to the polarization direction which is epsilon which is along the x axis which is along the E x unit vector. So, theta is this angle between epsilon and this direction of polarization and the photoelectron escape direction. So, this is the angle that is of importance in the present context. So, this cosine gamma is the spherical harmonics for l equal to 1 right m, a, m equal to 0 you can always write it like that and this is the direction with respect to which you are measuring the angles and it is useful to introduce what are called as renormalized spherical harmonics. They are the same as spherical harmonics as you can see, there is just a constant factor root of 4 pi over 2 k plus 1, which is like normalization, which is called as renormalization of the spherical harmonics. So, it is just the size which is scaled by this root of 4 pi over 2 k plus 1 and this matrix element is therefore, written in terms of the matrix element of the renormalized spherical harmonics. So, there is a factor of r over here and there is the rest of the spherical harmonics and then there is 
this root of 4 pi over 3. So, that is already contained over here. So, you can write this as a matrix element of the renormalized spherical harmonics. Okay. So, that is for uh, k uh, in, in, in this case, which is y 1. right? So, k is equal to 1. So, you have 2 plus 3 in the denominator, it is root 4 pi over 3 as you get it. So, this is the matrix element of the renormalized spherical harmonics. And now, you have the matrix element of this r into c in an initial state, which is hydrogenic. So, we are using the non-relativistic formulation at this point. So, this will be n, l and m. So, I am using n prime, l prime and n, m prime for the initial state. So, this is the wave function for the hydrogenic initial state. The final state wave function, we have written in terms of this expansion, okay, which we have just discussed. So, now, you plug in this matrix element, sandwich it between these final states and the initial state. right? So, this is the final state, this is the initial state, you have got a summation over L and M. And this is essentially, what is this? This is a space integral, right? This matrix element is essentially a space integral and it includes integration over r going from 0 to infinity and also integration over the angles uh, theta and phi, which will go over the entire space. So, this is a radial integral. So, this is an integration from 0 to infinity of r square d r is the volume element, you have got the radial function of the initial state, the initial bound state. This is the continuum state radial function, which includes the phase shift, whose argument includes the phase shift. This is the operator r, which is coming in from here. This is the matrix element of r into c. So, this r comes in over here. right? So, this is the radial integral, and then there is an angular integration, which is the matrix element of the renormalized spherical harmonics between the angular functions of the final state for which you have got the y l m of r and the y l m prime of r. Okay? The rest of the angular factors are contained in the a l m. Okay? So, this is the angular integration which is to be determined. So, there is one angular integration over here and a space integration over here then multiplication scaled by this factor a l m and then you need to sum over l and m. So, that is the matrix element that you will have to put and that will give you the transition rate and then its modular square will give you the transition probability, which we have related to the photoionization cross section. So, that you will get the complete distribution, but then it will also be connected to the d sigma by d omega, which is the angle dependent cross section. right? So, it is the differential cross section per unit solid angle. So, A l m we have already defined earlier on the slide 131, we will use that from there. And now, we need the matrix element of this renormalized spherical harmonic and to get this, we use the wigner eckhart theorem and that will give factor out the matrix element of C 1 and it will give us a Klebsch Gordon coefficient or a Wigner 3 j symbol, they are all related to each other. Okay. So, I will let you work with the details and using the Wigner Eckhart theorem, you get this expression. So, now the angular part and the, the, the space part and the physical part is already taken care of and this particular matrix element of the reduced spherical harmonic from elementary angular momentum algebra is given by this phase factor times square root of L large, where L large is the larger of L and L prime and G is given by this L prime minus L plus 1 by 2. Okay. So, this is what you get and once you put in all of these expressions, you get the matrix element in terms of these angular factors, including the Wigner 3 j symbol, which is essentially a Klebsch Cardan coefficient, and then you have got the radial integral over here. Okay. So, we will have to use the radial integral 
explicitly and uh, we are now going to plug it back into the expression for the differential cross section, which was essentially the matrix element of this operator, the gradient operator and then in the dipole approximation you get the connection between the momentum and the position operator. right? So, that is all coming together now and all of these relations are going to come together, because we are now looking at the matrix element of the position operator, the x operator which is r cosine gamma, which is the matrix element of this t, but then the psi f is to be used according to the ingoing wave boundary condition as we have just discussed. And we will of course, need the modulus square of this and this matrix element is now includes these angular factors, the Wigner 3 j or the Klebsch Gordon coefficients as they are, these radial integrals, these angular factors and the summation over L and M. And L of course, goes from 0 through infinity. Okay. However, you do not need these infinite summations, because you are working within the dipole approximation. So, transitions only to delta L equal to plus or minus 1 will be involved. So, you will have to deal with fewer terms. And then when you take the modulus square, you have the psi f t psi i and then the complex conjugate of that. Okay? So, this is the modulus square that you are going to need. So, we have this expression for the matrix element of the operator t and you will need the complex conjugate of that to multiply this. So, you will have a summation over L in one of these expressions and again a summation over L and M in the complex conjugate. So, you will have summations over you know L 1 and L 2, there are two summations over L quantum numbers and two summations over M quantum numbers. You will of course, exploit the orthogonality relations of the Klebsch Gordon coefficients. So, you are then left with you know an averaging over all the M prime states, because M prime goes from minus L to plus M. So, you, there is a division by 1 over 2 L plus 1 when you average out over all those states. So, you got a 1 over 2 L plus 1 factor and you now have a relation which has got a quadratic term in the radial integral. This is the radial integral d, it comes twice, once from here and the other from here, but there is no complex conjugation because the radial integrals are real. And then you have got two of these 3 j's and the corresponding phase factors and the square root of the orbital angular momentum quantum number. And then two of these A factors, the angular factors A L M, one coming from this element and the complex conjugate coming from here. So, those are all the terms. Okay. So, everything is taken care of. All right. So, you have got plenty of summations but you do not really need the prime anymore, because there is nothing which uh, we are no longer using L, because we are using L 1 and L 2. So, you do not need the prime anymore. So, I drop the prime in this relation now. Okay? It is the same relation written with L instead of L prime, just to make the notation a little simpler. We do not need the prime anymore. We needed it only when we were distinguishing between L and L prime but for L we have used L 1 and L 2. So, we do not have L anymore. So, that is the reason we can do away with the prime now. So, you have got L 1 here and L 2 here and L over here instead of L prime. So, that was the orbital angular momentum quantum number we had used for the initial state. Okay, so, this is what we have got and now A L M s we already have from our earlier discussion. And because we are using the dipole approximation, you do not have to worry about summation over L 1 and L 2 going from 0 through infinity, 
because only those transitions will take place for which delta L is equal to either plus 1 or minus 1, everything else will vanish, right. But these selection rules again as we have discussed earlier come from the wigner eckhart theorem, right. So, delta L is equal to plus 1 or minus 1 and it is because we have the dipole approximation, okay, which is uh, the operator which comes in when you set e to the i k dot r equal to 1 by ignoring higher powers of r over lambda. So, it is a low energy approximation and in this approximation you have only delta L equal to plus or minus 1 and from these double summations you can have a maximum of 4 terms, 2 terms coming from 1 corresponding to delta L equal to plus or minus 1 and another 2 coming from the other summation over L 2, right. So, at the most you have to work with 4 terms, so that really makes life easy, all of these infinite summations immediately collapse into just no more than 4 terms, so that should make us happy. And then all we have to do is to get the values of the Wigner 3 j and these are available in various tables of angular momentum coefficients and you know shifts quantum mechanics or Landon Lipschitz or you know any book on angular momentum algebra will give you standard tables. You can also get them from first principles using the recursion relations, so that is not a big deal, right. So, you evaluate these which are given by the factors which I have written over here, okay. So, these are the values of the 3 j's. So, now you have got everything except for the radial integrals and the ALMs which include the spherical harmonics, the phase shifts and so on, right. The phase shifts are e to the i delta terms, right. So, these include the cosine delta and the sine delta terms. So, these are the trigonometric functions, okay the cosine delta and the sine delta term. So, now you can write this whole expression in terms of trigonometric functions and the radial integrals which and there are two of them. So, you will get an expression which is quadratic in the radial integrals. What else will it include? It will include the phase shifts and the phase shifts will appear as arguments of trigonometric functions as cosine and sine terms. Okay. So, what Cooper Zare did was to introduce a parameter which includes these terms. So, there is a quadratic term in the radial integral which is sigma. Okay. So, sigma L minus 1 is the radial integral from L prime to L minus 1 to L prime minus 1. Okay. So, that is the transition to the final state in the continuum whose orbital angular momentum quantum number is less by 1 compared to that of the initial state. So, there is a term in sigma L minus 1 square, there is a term in sigma L plus 1 square and there is a cross term in sigma L plus 1 and sigma L minus 1. Then there are the phase shifts, they appear over here. Okay they come as a difference of this cosine argument. So, this is manipulating the trigonometric terms. So, it is a little bit of algebra that one has to do and Cooper's air were able to put it in a form which is extremely compact by introducing this parameter. So, this parameter is a dynamical parameter. It is of course, a function of energy because your matrix elements depend on energy, your phase shifts depend on energy, right. So, it is an energy dependent parameter and by introducing this parameter, you can write this expression which is a rather complicated expression, but you can present it in a very simple form which is called as a Cooper's air formula. So, these radial integrals are in some papers written as sigma, we have used d over here and in some literature they are used, they have used capital R. Now, this is this capital R is not the radial function, it is this radial integral. Okay. So, the notation is you know different in different pieces of literature, so that need not confuse you. So, when you see a quadratic term over here, 
whether it is sigma or this capital R or this d square, you know it is a radial integral and you know that this is the radial integral that is being referenced. So, these are you know various notations which are used in literature and using this expression for beta, the differential cross section which seems to have a rather complicated structure can now be written in a very simple form which is sigma over 4 pi 1 plus beta times this Legendre polynomial for L equal to 2. Okay. The Legendre polynomial for L equal to 2 is this half of 3 cos square theta minus 1 and this parameter has got the information which you need to get the angular distributions, because we are developing the expression for the differential cross section. So, so d sigma by d omega is the differential cross section, it is a measure of transition probability corresponding to photo electron escape right in a given direction. What is the direction of escape? It is along k f, it is along the unit vector k f right corresponding to electromagnetic radiation being polarized along a certain direction which we have referred to as epsilon. In our analysis we have taken it to be the x axis, but it can be any direction in space it does not matter, but with reference to that theta this uppercase theta is the polar angle corresponding to that direction whatever it is okay, that is what we have found out. Okay. So, with reference to the direction of polarization of the electromagnetic radiation theta is the corresponding polar angle, it is not the polar angle with respect to the z axis of the original geometry that we had, but it is a polar angle with reference to the direction of polarization of the electromagnetic radiation. So, this is the theta and this is the measure of how much of photo electron yield you will ex expect in this direction for this direction of polarization. Okay. It is a measure of that and it is given by this total cross section, it is a certain part of the total cross section, because when you integrate this over all angles, you will get the total cross section. right? So, you need to integrate this over all the angles to get the total cross section, but this is a part of the total and this part is the corresponding part which is relevant to the direction theta. So, if you keep a detector in the direction theta, this is what you are going to measure, this is the amount of yield that you will measure with reference to a certain you know calibration procedures. So, essentially beta is then giving you the angular distribution, which is why it is called as the photo electron angular distribution parameter. This is again in the dipole approximation, so this is called as the dipole angular distribution asymmetry parameter. So, this is the Cooper's air formula and um, I have uh, uploaded the Cooper's air paper at our course web page. So, you can go through the details uh, in this paper and this is now a summary of what we have got. This is the differential cross section, which is now written in a very compact form, which is a part of sigma, sigma divided by 4 pi and then you have got the 1 plus beta and the Legendre polynomial for L equal to 2. So, beta is the angular distribution asymmetry parameter. Now, differential cross section of course, is a positive quantity, right? it is transition probability. So, it is a po positive quantity, it has to be greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, 1 plus beta times P 2 cos theta must be greater than or equal to 0 and that puts some limits on beta, that automatically generates some limits on beta. What are those limits? Because b this beta over 2 times this must be greater than or equal to minus 1 and theta can only take values between 0 and pi corresponding to which cos square theta can take values only between 0 and 1. So, those are the minimum and the maximum values of cos square theta. So, if you put the corresponding values minimum and maximum values of cos square theta over here, you will get the minimum and maximum value that beta can take. So, what are those? So, if you take cos square theta, the maximum value is 1. So, beta has to be greater than or equal to minus 1 and cos square theta minimum value is 0. So, beta has to be less than or equal to 2. 
So, these are the limits of the angular dis distribution asymmetry parameter, it can at the least be minus 1 and at the most it can be plus 2. Okay. So, you will always find angular distribution asymmetry parameter in these limits and you can find a discussion on this also in Branstad and Joshin's book or in Fano and Cooper and uh, Fano and Rao and there are number of other sources. So, this is the Cooper's air formula for the angular distribution of photo electrons. Now, let us take a special case if you study photonization of L equal to 0 okay, and it does, does not matter what the n quantum number is, because for L equal to 0 this term will vanish this is L into L minus 1, this term is 6 into L times something. So, this will also vanish, this is L plus 1 times L plus 2. So, L is equal to 0, so this is 1 and this is 2, so you get twice sigma square in the numerator and in the denominator L is equal to 0. So, 2 L will be 0 and this will be 1 times the rest, again L is 0 over here, so this term will vanish and you will have the remaining term which is L plus 1 which is 0 plus 1, so it is again sigma square. So, you get 2 sigma square over sigma square corresponding to the transition delta L equal to plus 1. Okay. And the radial integral contribution, the quadratic term in the radial integral in the numerator and the denominator cancel each other, it does not matter what the value is. Okay. So, no matter what energy you are talking about, the radial integral is a function of energy of course, the phase shifts are functions of energy, but it does not matter whatever they are beta turns out to be a constant number which is equal to 2. So, for photoionization from the n s subshell, okay, it does not matter what is the value of n 1 s 2 s 3 s 4 s whatever, for photoionization for from the n s subshell of any atom beta must always be equal to 2 and independent of the principal quantum number also independent of energy and you can develop similar relations for other values of L for special cases. For example, we have discussed the Cooper minimum right? and when you have a Cooper minimum in the L plus 1 channel for example, okay, if the transition corresponding to delta L equal to plus 1 that matrix element is going through a 0 which is a Cooper minimum then sigma L plus 1 will go to 0 over there. This sigma L plus 1 will also go to 0 and then you will have only the remaining terms. So, you can simplify the expressions for beta for special cases where you have Cooper minimum either in the L plus 1 channel or even in the L minus 1 channel, okay. but typically you have Cooper minima in the L plus 1 channel, but that is a matter of detail that you can read in Fahn and Cooper's paper. So, now for S subshell, if you look at the expression for the differential cross section for the special case of L equal to 0, which is photonization of the N S subshell, then you put beta equal to 2 in this expression over here and you get a simple cos square theta distribution. Okay. So, photonization from all S subshells will be typically given by this cos square dependence. Now, there are of course, further modifications, because we have used a non relativistic approximation. right? So, when you do this whole analysis using relativistic considerations, you will have transitions to different final states, which are split by the spin orbit interaction. Okay? And there will be a spin orbit splitting also of the initial state. So, there are some details that you need to consider and then the relativistic formula, which we will not discuss is what is given by Walker and Weber. And then we have still not taken into account even after taking into account the relativistic interactions, you have to plug in other details, because there of course, are the electron correlations in many electron atoms that you must include. right? So, you have to include relativistic the you know corrections, you also have to introduce many body corrections due to uh, the Coulomb correlations and these are not included in the hartree fock or even in the Dirac hartree fock which is a relativistic self consistent field study 
right even in, in the relativistic self consistent field you do not have the electron correlations and you must take those into account and these this is a matter of detail which goes beyond the scope of our discussion in this course but then um, there have been uh, studies in which these uh, correlations have been included and the relativistic many body correlations uh, those expressions are developed by johnson and lin in the random phase approximation so some of these things are matters of details for further study and then of course one can also go beyond the dipole because the dipole approximation essentially by its very name as we know it is an approximation because we have truncated e to the i k dot r only equal to 1 is what gives us the dipole approximation. If you take the next term you already go beyond the dipole and this will already introduce certain corrections. Okay. So, what kind of corrections does it introduce? You need to consider matrix elements of some other operators not just the dipole operator, but you get the some other operators like the electric quadrupole operator and the magnetic dipole operator. So, so these get into the picture and you have to include corrections for these when you go beyond the dipole approximation and what was left out of the Cooper's air formula. The Cooper's air formula had only this dipole angular distribution right it had only this beta over 2 times 3 cos square theta minus 1, but now you have additional terms and delta and gamma are now the non dipole angular distribution asymmetry parameters. Okay. So, you have to go beyond the dipole approximation as a matter of fact even at low energies means we have uh, argued that the dipole approximation is a good approximation for low energies it is a high wavelength approximation, but then nevertheless it is an approximation and then even at low energy sometimes depending on the kind of measurements you are carrying out and you can carry out extremely high precision measurements because now the electronics is very powerful okay the detection is detection devices are very powerful light sources are very powerful you have typically these measurements are done at synchrotron radiation laboratories where you have got a very powerful light source over a wide spectrum of energies okay over large wavelength regions and in India these experiments are now possible at the Indus synchrotron and that is the only place where we have a synchrotron in India, but there are a good number of synchrotrons in the world and many of these measurements are carried out at various synchrotron laboratories and you can actually measure these non dipole angular distribution asymmetry parameters and the theory has to be good enough to be able to correspond to those experiments. So, it has to include relativistic effects it also has to include the many body correlation effects. So, these are the non dipole angular distribution asymmetry parameters delta and gamma and uh, here is a reference in which you can read further about it. So, one can carry out measurements which are really very interesting you there is a technique which is known as the time of flight spectrometer and you can set up three time of flight spectrometers and you know finally, you know th these are measurements which experimentalists carry out and you locate these detectors not over all space because you do have to get angular distributions. It does not mean that you are have to carry out measurement at every single angle. You can get all that information by carrying out measurements only at some of the angles and then get information about everything else. So, how do you do that? In fact, if you do if you have three analyzers in a time of flight spectrometer one at theta equal to 0 and phi equal to 90 degrees another at 54.7 degrees and phi equal to 90 degrees and fifth another at 54.7 degrees theta and phi equal to 0 degrees then you can get all of this information how because what happens at theta equal to 0 sin theta vanishes so these terms go away right and at 54.7 the cosine term gives you 1 over root 3 cosine of 54.7 is 1 over root 3. So, you got the square of that. So, that is one third. So, one third times 3 will give you 1. So, 1 minus 1 vanishes right and phi is 90. So, cosine phi is 0 and what do you get? 
you get d sigma by d omega equal to the total cross section divided by 4 pi. So, by just carrying out measurement at just this one angle, just one angle, single angle, you get the total cross section. Okay? So, it is like magic, which is why it is called as a magic angle. Sorry? Instead of sigma dot, yeah, because it depends on n and l quantum numbers. Okay, it is for a particular n l initial state. Okay, all the terms are l dependent. Yeah, but the expression for beta, the angular distribution asymmetry parameter, okay, it has got l everywhere. Look at this. Okay, so this certainly depends on the orbital angle of a quantum number of the initial state. But this is the non-relativistic expression. In the relativistic expression, you need the kappa quantum number, not the l. Okay, so beta, of course, is l-dependent. So the differential cross-section is for a given initial state, which is n described by n and l in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which is the expression that we have. But then in the relativistic expression, you will have the kappa quantum number, which we have discussed rather than the L quantum number. And you have at this magic angle, you can get the total cross section by carrying out measurements just at this angle, which is called as a magic angle. Then you can carry your measurements at phi equal to 0 and at phi equal to 0, cosine phi will be 1 and then sin theta, which is sin of 54.7 is 0.816. So, but then this is the magic angle. So, this term will vanish and the dipole terms go away and you get only the non-dipole angular distribution parameters from this. Okay? So, sometimes you know this is a very important analyzer because you get the non-dipole parameters from this. So, by carrying out these measurements intelligently by setting up your detectors, at very special angles, you can get a lot of information. So, uh, you can get some references over here in this paper. So, I will give you some of the essential references, then we conclude discussion on the angular distribution of photoelectrons and also this unit. So, this is the classic paper by Cooper Zare, which uh, I have uploaded on our course uh, web page already. Uh, the Walker and Weber gives you the relativistic formula and then when you include the electron correlations, then of course, you do not have exact solutions. Okay? When you have a many body problem, you do not have exact solutions. So, one of the very powerful method to include the electron correlations, even if it is not exact and there is no exact solution, but one of the very powerful techniques is what is called as a relativistic random phase approximation developed by Johnson and Lin. And you will find the expression for the angular distribution asymmetry parameter developed in this uh, paper by Johnson and Lin. And with that, I will conclude. But then, my usual goodbye slide, I thought I will modify a little bit, because I found one interesting slide on the internet, which will ensure that you have understood everything that I have said. It will give you some confidence in what you have learnt, because I am sure you are going to say yes, you do not want me to repeat the class. <laughs> so, by saying yes, you will gain some confidence. So, thank you very much if there are any questions. If you have really not understood something, please ask, <laughs> I will be happy to answer. But otherwise, say yes and go with confidence that you have understood everything or else I repeat. Questions? In the non relativistic approximation, this is the non relativistic. Relativistically, you have transitions to the singlet and triplet, and you can have the matrix element changing, and beta can actually go to minus 1 at Cooper minimum in one of the two channels, even for S, even for low Z atoms. So, sometimes you have relativistic effects become extremely important, means the usual belief is that they are important only for high z atoms, but even for low z atoms, because you have these two channels at the Cooper minimum in one channel, 
beta can go to minus 1. It can also go to minus 1 in the region of autoionization resonances. Yeah. So, these are you know there are several details that one can discuss and go beyond this, but I hope that this will introduce you to original literature in this paper. Any other question? So, thank you very much.